Thank you for joining the session. I make it on the hour, so let's start now. I'm recording this session, so accordingly you are all on mute. If you do have any questions, if you wouldn't mind using the questions or chat box in your GoToMeeting connection or GoToWebinar connection, and I will address the questions um, at an appropriate break. Today we're going to be discussing process automation and how to increase your process automation in Sage 300 using ORCID Systems modules. ORCID Systems has been developing add-on solutions to enhance Sage 300 for a long while now. We're based in Sydney, Australia and have been in business since 1993. At this stage, we have sold our modules. Our modules are running in over 5,000 sites worldwide. And on average, most sites are running two modules. All our solutions are developed through the Sage 300 SDK. And what this means for you is that they will support um, all the standard utilities that the core Sage 300 modules support. For example, the report writers, the same look and feel, the ability to be able to back up the database um, through a dump and a load, and the standard import-export features. Over the years, two of our modules have been OEM'd and gold certified with Sage 300. Over these, this time, we've created a close working relationship with the Sage development team in Richmond, which we think uh, gives us an edge in, in our development. Over the years, we've developed um, 13 different modules, and they fall into these five major categories. Collaboration and intelligence, where we have Info Explorer, our BI tool, Notes, which provide context-sensitive notes, and Document Management Link, which provide context-sensitive documents. And I'll be showing Document Management Link as part of today's presentation. In the automation and productivity, we have Process Scheduler, which allows you to automate tasks, Sage 300 tasks, and Report Runner, which allows you to schedule and um, generate and distribute uh, crystal reports and financial reports. And I'll be running through those two modules as well today. In tailoring your system and integration, we have extender, data views, and optional tables, all which provide features, different aspects of systems integration, and indeed process automation. And I'll be running through the process automation side of extender today. Streamlining financial processes, we have EFT processing, electronic funds processing, which allows you to direct debit customers and or pay vendors electronically with your bank. Inter-entity trade, which allows you to mirror um, transactions between different companies or different entities. Um, and this is good for groups of companies all using Sage 300, where the different entities are providing goods or services for the for, yeah, bit between each other. And inter-entity transactions, which allows you to automate the loan account entries when doing uh, either processing um, the expense or revenue entries, which relate in whole or partially to other entities. For example, paying an accounts payable invoice for your phone bill, um, half of it may, might belong to entity one and half might belong to entity two. So inter-entity transactions automates the loan account entries between the um, companies when companies are doing uh, transactions on behalf of other entities. And in the operations management, we have return material authorizations and repair tracking, which allows you to manage the returns process and automate and or control the returns pace, uh, process more closely, and bin tracking, which provides um, an extra level of control on your IC items by providing a bin or multiple bins with inner location which you can track the item quantities. But today I'm going to concentrate on business process automation, what it is, why you'd want to do it, how you can do it, and what ORCID modules allow you to automate further. Any business task performed regularly by following a repeatable set of steps is really a business process. And by implementing Sage 300 or any business software, you're already down the road for BPA. But this can be taken further than what the core modules and subledgers provide. Why would you want to do that? Manual processes create multiple opportunities for delay and error. 
and by eliminating um, errors and or automating mundane and repeatable tasks, you can increase efficiency um, by reducing these tasks or making them happen repeatably and predictably. This gives uh, staff more time for value-added processing as well as customers benefit through the improved um, service delivery through consistency, perhaps through efficiently or more speedily processing and uh, repeatability of this service. How can you go about implementing business pro process automation? So the thing to do is to look at uh, the current business process you have, look at them critically and, um, and uh, rigorously and identify which, which processes have either a lot of mundane repeatable tasks or are highly error prone or both. So you identify which ones are candidates for business process automation and then develop an action plan to, on how you can implement that and importantly um, how you can measure the, um, the improvements that you have uh, to help validate what other processes that you should um, you know, then look at for doing new processes, uh, automating new processes. So by reducing your costs or more efficiently using your resources or eliminating mundane and manual tasks, you get improved productivity which can provide value add for increased innovation as your staff have more time to analyze as opposed to manually repeat tasks. And by being able to consistency, consistently apply the same steps to a mundane and manual tasks, you can increase the speed and reduce the errors um, in those tasks, which can result in improved service delivery and therefore increased customer satisfaction. And providing more status tracking and issue escalation and support of business intel intelligence in general, you can get increased transparency of your activities, which often leads to improved compliance. So looking at some of the um, regular business processes or tasks that people run consistently and uh, regularly in Sage 300, um, uh, and which ORCID module can help automate um, or escalate or audit those particular tasks running. So look at first at Process Scheduler. This module allows you to schedule the, the regular tasks that get performed in Sage 300. For example, the day ends, the post batches and backups. So Process Scheduler allows you to automate these tasks to run after hours um, and to run every day thereby freeing up both system resources and your own uh, resources in terms of having to manually do these tasks every day. On the systems integrity side, you can ensure that integ integrity checks get run. You can run things like disk space checking to ensure that uh, these tasks happen daily or weekly, depending on the schedule that you want. But Process Scheduler can seamlessly automate these tasks. I'm looking at Process Scheduler in conjunction with um, our modules Report Runner and Info Explorer. You can use Process Scheduler to, to generate, to schedule and generate and distribute both crystal reports, financial reports and indeed Info Explorer cubes. No longer do people need to uh, run these tasks, uh, you know, wait for them to finish and then email them off to the relevant people. It can happen automatically, overnight, daily, weekly, monthly, depending on the need for those particular uh, bits of information, financial reports, crystal reports, or cubes. Uh, using Process Scheduler and Extender, you can schedule um, extender scripts, which can allow you, which can automate uh, types of alerts or exceptions that you need to be notified on or need to um, check and see when they're happening to regularly perform certain tasks. For example, in collections management, a process scheduler can schedule an extender script which runs through all outstanding open um, invoices, sees which invoices are overdue, and then emails the sales rep, the associated sales rep with the customer, um, emails them which customers are overdue and um, what are they overdue by. So this saves 
manually running reports to then check which people are overdue and then do your follow-up um, phone calls. Uh, you would just have a, an email with a list of customers or an individual email per customer for those customers that are now overdue based on the day being one day later. Similarly, in logistics management, you might need to send alerts to the operations management team uh, to alert them of which uh, sales orders which were due to be shipped today and were not, or which purchase orders which were due to be received today and were not. So extender can, you, in Extender you can write any sort of exception and build an email and uh, process scheduler can schedule that to alert people of when exceptions are happening rather than having to manually run all these reports and then check for those exception conditions, saving them time and uh, uh, energy. Using Extender, uh, we can automate uh, the systems integration process or any custom process that you need in Sage 300. For example, for systems integration, you might have a synchronized website with a list of all your suppliers and uh, you need to synchronize the supplier code, uh, name and address and contact details, either when they're first created in Sage 300 and or when any of those fields are amended in Sage 300. So without some sort of integration, what you would need to do is key the details first in Sage 300 and then key the details in the website and that's open to uh, people forgetting to do it and or errors and inconsistencies in the data. But if you use Extender and trigger a custom process to update the website, um, but trigger it as and when the vendor is inserted or the vendor a cus a name and address and contact details are amended and only in those circumstances, only when those fields that you're interested in are amended, then trigger a custom written process, um, you can automate uh, the synchronization of the data. Similarly, you might be doing sales orders for assembled items or items that need to be assembled. And uh, you could um, write an extender script uh, which allows you to, when you ship a, a bill of materials item, if there's insufficient stock in that particular location for that bill of materials item, you could auto-assemble um, in the background. So Extender can either write, in Extender, you can either call Extender scripts to do external, um, additional external updates to systems, or you could have Extender automating internal Sage 300 processes. And all of this can be triggered as and when it's needed, event-driven, as opposed to just on a timely basis, checking, doing a snapshot on the database and automating based on snapshots. Another example of our modules um, is uh, Extender and Notes working together. And two examples I'm going to uh, demonstrate is um, order and invoice management and a logistics management. Firstly, on order and invoice management, you might have the business process that when an order is shipped and invoiced, the email is, the invoice is emailed to the customer. So to do this in Sage 300, you need to uh, run the invoice report, uh, save the document, uh, preview it, save it as a PDF, and then create an email and attach that PDF and send it off to the customer. So extender and notes in combination can automate that process either into one button click or two button clicks or um, automatically when the invoice is created. I'm going to de demonstrate using two button clicks. Another example would be in logistics management, the ability to um, send the customer the, um, the send an email when an, when your item, when their items are shipped send them an email with the consignment note number and the expected delivery date. So this needn't ha manually happen each time you uh, ship, a, ship an order. It could happen automatically on the basis of the shipment being created. And the last module I'm going to show you regarding automation and, and uh, process automation is document management link and its ability to uh, manage the documents or the link to the documents and uh, control the distribution of those documents. So when I attach my AP invoice, when I'm entering the AP invoice, not only can I see it 
in the AP invoice entry screen, but I could see it when I do a vendor activity inquiry or a vendor inquiry or when I'm doing my payment processing, I will still be able to link back to that document without manually having to try and find it or uh, we're still printing it off and manually distributing it. But I'm also going to show you um, documents being available between two companies, for example, when you're using inter-entity trade and you might have a purchase order from your customer for certain items in your wholesale or retail customer, uh, company, but those items need to be assembled in your manufacturing company and you want that customer PO to be visible to staff in uh, both the sales order staff in your company one, the purchase order staff in company one where you're purchasing it from company two and the sales order staff in company two when they're going to be distributing um, and invoicing those items to the, through to the customer. So I'm just going to uh, start my Sage 300 and uh, show you some of those uh, topics that we've been discussing. First of all, I'm going to look at Process Scheduler. And in Process Scheduler, you have the ability to create multiple schedules. You can create as many schedules as you want and then schedule those schedules using the Windows Scheduler or Task Scheduler. So in Orc Limited, I have a number of schedules and the first one I'm going to show you is my day-end schedule. And what this schedule does, it runs a day-end in Orc Limited, then it posts all the system batches and by system batches we mean batches that get created as part of the day-end in Orc Limited. Then it's going to run a day-end in Orc Inc. 2 and then post the system batches in Orc Inc. 2. Looking at the schedule action detail in, in, in more detail, um, you can see it's running a day end, the company is Orc Limited, and we also have the ability to enter the additional parameters of the action that you're working on. So this particular action needs to know the path where you want to store the um, day end uh, logs so that uh, you can refer to them if you need to at a later stage. And on any action, you have the ability to tell it what step to do if there was an error on this particular action and what step to do if it was successful. So you can have multiple paths through your schedules um, if on the case of success or error. You can also, depending on the task, you could send an email if there was an error or send an email if it was successful or both or none, depending on the task. So in my case, if there was an error in my day end, I'm going to send an email. Otherwise, I'm not going to send an email. And I'm going to skip the uh, posting of batches. So if there's an error, I'm going to go to step 10, which is to run the day end in Orc um, Inc. 2, because there's no point trying to post batches if there was an error in my day end. And if it is successful, then I go to step five and I do my um, uh, post the batches and then go on to the day end in Orc, uh, Orc Inc. 2. So using Process Scheduler, you can automate any number and combination of all these different tasks, both in one database or across multiple databases. So we can check integrity, we can uh, refresh reports and queues, which I'll be showing you, we can check disk space, we can run and extend a script, we can do the day end, we can post any number of these uh, combinations of different batches that arise in the subledgers, and we can um, load copy databases, load databases, run external processes. We can do a GL consolidation export and import. So if you have a group of companies, 40 companies, say, consolidating to one particular um, company, rather than running, having to manually log into all 40 companies and do an export, 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 log into your consolidation company and do an import, you can set up a schedule to do all that for you and it can, you can log which ones have run and where errors occur. You can run financial reports. And you can also set up schedules to open fiscal periods and fiscal years um, and to close fiscal periods. So if you have three or four companies and you want to open um, order entry on day one um, and then perhaps close accounts receivable on day seven and close accounts payable on day 15, you could have a schedule that uh, runs on those specific dates and closes and opens periods for the particular modules that you want, saving manually having to do that, um, you know, to log in and, and, and select the correct periods for each company all the time. 
Another schedule I just want to show you is the data integrity schedule. So you could do this either all the modules in a company or um, you could do it for uh, individual modules in individual companies. This particular one runs a, a mod uh, a integrity check in Orkink 2 and then clears old logs older than 60 days for Orkink 2, otherwise those logs would just build up forever and does the same for Orkink 3 and then again for Orkink 4. So when you're doing schedules for um, integrity checks, not only can you send an email only when there's errors, but you can send an email only when there's a change on the number of errors. So if you have two errors in IC, for example, an old item that was deleted, and you know about that, uh, you can just uh, select the on change option and then you'll only get uh, an email if those, uh, those number of errors change in IC um, over time. And the third um, schedule that I'm going to show you is um, our ability to run reports or Info Explorer Cubes or financial reports. The one I'm going to show you is uh, Crystal Reports set by users. So this, this goes ahead and runs any Crystal Reports in Orc Limited, Orking 2 and Orking 3 that have been scheduled by the users to run on a certain frequency. So what you're able to do in Report Runner you are able to set up menus of crystal reports and financial reports. Looking at the crystal report side, you can create um, menus, add a section, creates the menu group, and then within a section, add a report. And here you're browsing to find a crystal.rpt. And the crystal report could be either a Sage 300 core module crystal report or any third party crystal report, or indeed any crystal report that's been written um, to run on this company uh, database. So you attach it, and when you attach the report, you would pre answer all the parameters that you don't want the users to change each time they run, and only leave visible those parameters that you do want them to run. So, for example, looking at this age trial balance report, all the parameters to do with uh, when to run, uh, what cutoff date to use, what aging uh, buckets to use has all been pre-answered. And all the, uh, the user needs to do is say what group um, do they want to run this particular um, or range of groups do they want to run this particular age trial balance. And if I want to schedule this to happen every day or once a week, I would click on the schedule option. And here I can say schedule my report, run it once or da daily, uh, weekly, monthly. Um, and I could say where I want to save this report. Um, if that's the distribution method or the only distribution method I want is that the, the report is run and put in a particular folder. And or I could uh, select the ability to um, email this. And when I do that, I can specify a number of email addresses and, a, and an email template where I can customize the, the message that gets sent with that report. So the users would say which reports they want to schedule, and then it's process scheduler really that fires that off at the appropriate time. And um, in that particular case, I, I ran that email uh, previously. So uh, yesterday I, I emailed the age trial balance. So the recipients get this particular email um, customized, uh, you know, depending which company it came from. And all they, instead of running the age trial balance and then seeing who's overdue, they would then just open up the uh, report and, and act on it accordingly. So I've shown you, and, and process scheduler can have um, additional tasks. Uh, you know, this is to run an information manager report, which is a crystal report, but it could be to run a um, run and refresh an Info Explorer cube and email that off, or it could be to run a financial report. So the next combination of modules that I'm going to show you is process scheduler working with extender. And uh, for this particular um, example, I'm going to look at my, my schedule called daily checks, which I would uh, schedule to run every day. And a process scheduler is able to run an extender script. So we have some sample um, um, scripts that can be downloaded and deployed or amended and deployed. Um, this particular one, uh, this script is going to be running in Orc Limited. And what it does is checks um, item by item, location by location, which items 
are less than the minimum quantity on hand required for that item in that location. And sends a single email per company to the logistics uh, manager or to the nominated email address showing which items are um, below their minimum quantity. The second uh, example, so this uh, script is going to be running on um, accounts receivable, all open um, transactions and checking which ones are overdue, not in terms of being over the credit limit but in terms of being outside the term, so the, uh, the invoice is overdue and it sends an email to the customer service rep showing the customers with a link, a dynamic link which allows you to link back into say 300 and have a look at that particular customer. So showing those uh, results of those scripts running um, yesterday, I just go back to my email. Here for example um, is a, an example of the IC location, um, the item having uh, not enough stock in each location. So this was run on Orc Limited. Um, it shows the items which are below their minimum stock level. Uh, the first one is item A11030 in location three. It's the quantity on hand is 42, and it's less than the minimum reorder, uh, the minimum uh, qu qu order quantity, which is uh, 230. If I uh, open the hyperlink. Uh, this particular hyperlink has been designed to open up the IC location detail for that particular item. If I didn't have Sage 300 open in the background, it would have first prompted me to log into the company and then it would have opened the IC location details for that particular item. Um, the example of the uh, outstanding, the overdue transactions, for example, um, customer 1105 um, is overdue. Uh, the outstanding balance is 19461, uh, the credit limit is 19,000, and uh, we could have listed the invoices if we wanted, but uh, we chose to link rather back to the customer activity screen so that you could open it up quickly and um, take action on that particular customer um, based on the outstanding transactions that you have. So that's um, two examples of showing, uh, you know, collections management being automated and logistics management being automated in terms of the alerting and uh, running of reports for further action that is required. I'm now going to look at our module extender and how it can um, automate certain processes. In extender, you can create as many events as you want. And uh, events can be of multiple types pre-configured types. Um, for example, you can log a change, you can um, send an email when something happens, you can create an information manager note when something happens, or this one that I'm going to show you is you can run a program when something happens. So the intention of this particular event is I would go and attach it to my vendor view, which is the business logic associated around maintaining vendors. And I would attach it to those fields that I'm interested in, in the name and address and the um, contact details. And I would, uh, by doing this, uh, this particular event and attaching it to the fields I'm interested in, this program would be called if any one of those fields is uh, newly created or amended on any particular vendor. Uh, this would be uh, designed to update an external um, database or uh, call a web service to up update a website. So Extender can, be, it can enable event-driven uh, systems integration. So when this happens, call this program to update um, this. But another example could be, you could say, um, and this is the screen, uh, the option that you use to attach your events to the particular views. And I'm just looking at the um, OE order details. And so the order entry detail view, so that's where you add items and non-stock items to your order. In this particular case, I'm running a script which uh, warns me that the sales margin is not the correct, or validates that the sales margin is in a particular range. But I could add a, a, add a script here to say, um, you know, if the item being shipped is a bill of materials item, then go ahead and create an assembly for that bill of materials and this is the quantity that I'd like you to assemble for this particular bill of materials item number and bill of materials number. 
So any process can, any Sage 300 process can be automated and triggered at the point in time that you need those transactions or that process to be run. Because Extender is event driven, it's, pro it's automating based on the event happening. When A happens, then do B. Another example of using Extender, um, and in this case, uh, Information Manager Notes, um, to automate or man help you manage to certain processes is in um, order management, order and invoice management. So I'm just opening up my um, order entry uh, screen and um, searching for an order. So in this case, I'm looking at order 33. Um, it's been invoiced under invoice number 31. And uh, this is a document management link um, configured directory, which is showing me the invoices I have already created for this particular customer 1240. And as you can see, I haven't yet generated or created the PDF for invoice number 31. So using um, notes and the ability of notes to display the results of an, an extender script, I'm able, this particular custom script, which again is an, exa uh, an example script up on the website, I'm able to display uh, a little box with two buttons, one saying print um, and PDF this particular invoice for me, and one saying email. And yes, it could have been designed to all happen in one, in one step, but it was my choice to print an email separately. So when I click on the print button, it's going to uh, run the nominated uh, invoice format uh, and PDF that and save it away in the directory as configured uh, by document management link. So it would have created the directory I needed for 1240 if it didn't already exist and add um, a PDF numbered in 31 in that particular directory. Um, and that will show in this, uh, in this directory list next time this is um, refreshed. But I can also email that. So in this case, it's going to my email templates, seeing what email that I, you know, constructing the email, um, sending it through to the customer uh, based on that template and attaching um, invoice uh, 31. And here I've received uh, this particular uh, invoice. So if I go into my email, you can see we've got a, a new uh, email arrived today. Uh, this is the body of the email that we can include variables of the, um, of the custom of, of the invoice, um, and uh, we can attach the attached document, in this, in this case, invoice 31. Um, and another example um, of uh, extender, uh, with uh, logistics extender and notes with logistics management, you could have a similar sort of button um, to email the customer the notification of the consignment that's been created when an item around the OE shipment screen, or perhaps you might even want to automate that whenever you create a shipment, then email the cons customer the consignment note details. Um, and the last module that I want to show you um, for automation of um, document management and the distribution of documents is document management link. Firstly, I'm going to show you document management link configured around um, AP invoice entry. In this case, I'm going to be, um, this, you know, this is designed for the person who's entering AP invoices every day. Um, and what we've designed in document management link is to show around the AP invoice entry screen to show the, all the documents that we have associated with this particular vendor and in this uh, box uh, to isolate and highlight the individual invoice that you're currently working on. So these document management link boxes uh, could be a network folder or file share which is what I'm currently working with here or they could be configured in cloud services, for example, SharePoint, or locally installed SharePoint, uh, or SharePoint as distributed with Office 365, or other cloud services such as Google Drive and Dropbox um, or one, uh, OneNote, uh, any of those uh, shared cloud services for sharing documents. The particular workflow that I'm looking at here is um, of a day, people would detach invoices that have been emailed into, into their company and or scan the, the, um, the invoices that are received 
by the, uh, scan them and put the scan documents into this particular folder. So my workflow today is to enter all these uh, invoices that have been uh, received today. So I would double click on one of those documents, open it up, see that it's an invoice for uh, vendor 1200, whatever the dollar value is, and the invoice number is 8899. So I'd enter those details on my AP invoice entry, and then I can just uh, simply uh, drag and drop that particular document into that folder. Normally, I would uh, you know, use the control key to cut and paste the document across, so my scanned documents will get smaller and smaller and only contain those documents that I've yet to enter. What you'll notice is that uh, document management link uh, actually relabeled that uh, document based on the invoice number that was visible in the in the screen or that had been entered in the screen. So it's helping to categorize and uh, and file away the invoices appropriately. If that folder hadn't existed or the SharePoint library hadn't existed, as long as the network user has permissions to do the creation, it would have created a library in the background or a folder in the background and then placed the file um, in that particular folder. And now once I've associated this uh, particular document with this vendor and with this document number, whether I'm in AP payment entry, or AP um, vendor inquiry or AP vendors, if I've configured document management link to show all these invoices, I would see the invoices either in a full list like this or isolating the individual transaction for the active transaction on the screen. So no longer do we need to print off copies and manually distribute them or e email them off to who needs to look at those invoices before they're approved or before payments, uh, payments are done. Um, another example of using document management link to share and distribute uh, documents with uh, automatically is using, um, if you're using ORCID's uh, inter-entity trade, uh, you can associate documents with uh, one document in one company and make it available to uh, the staff uh, looking at the associated or mirrored document in another company. And the example I'm going to show you um, started off with um, order entry and here I entered my sales order for my outside customer. So for customer 1200, I entered my sales order for the items that they, they were ordering. So let's just uh, find this particular sales order. It's sales order 81. So customer 1200 ordered uh, three items from me, uh, the two desk lamps and some bulbs. But the two desk lamps um, had a particular finish that they wanted, as I saw in the, uh, the purchase order from that customer. And I need to order those two from my um, manufacturing or assembly company uh, to get the particular finish that they want. So when the customer sent me the PO, PO543, originally I would have, um, I just need to scroll down on my uh, document, uh, my links and alerts. Originally, I would have um, attached, uh, in the same way I did my AP invoice, I would have dragged and dropped the original PO into this box and had it uh, label it for me, original PO, and then the associated purchase order number. So when I did my original sales order, I would have attached the customer purchase order to it. And just opening that up, we see that um, th the customer wants uh, a particular finish on the desk lamps and a finish on the halogen desk lamps. So using inter-entity trade by um, using Shipfire as my association, anything in, in my particular configuration, any item that I've associated Shipfire E2 to will create a purchase order in Orc Limited and the purchase order will be on Orking 2 to create a, 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 PO, um, a PO and associated mirrored sales order in Orking 2 for these two items. So I'll just go um, and open up purchase orders and, uh, and uh, then uh, show you that the PO, the original customer PO is still linked to the purchase order. But just to highlight here, um, I have another document management link box which associates 
which uh, just shows me any documents that anyone has associated with uh, my original sales order number 81. So here I actually see the shipping instructions that were attached by Orking 2 when they uh, drop ship those particular items through to, uh, to my customer. So let's just first look at the purchase order. When I first created the sales order, uh, the purchase order was created. And if I just go into PO um, transactions and have a look at my purchase order. And I know the purchase order that was created was PO39. So looking at PO39, you can see it's for the two particular items that, uh, that we had on sales order 81. And uh, by configuration, I sent the original sales order number through to this particular reference. And that is why I can see the documents associated with that particular reference. So when the purchase order was first created, the only document I would have seen here was my original PO from, from the uh, customer. Uh, and, but now I'm seeing the shipping instructions that were attached by Orking 2. But if I go across into Orking 2 and just look at the sales order that was created uh, based on the purchase order that was created in Ork Limited. So here's the, the sales order that was mirrored from purchase order um, 39. And uh, here we can see, and we I've still linked back to my um, original sales order 81 that was created in Ork Limited for the customer 1200. And because I still have this reference and trade automatically created this document and passed through the, the uh, required reference, I can, I can still, in, as an operator in Orking 2, I still have access to the original PO and I can see what finish uh, the, the customer wanted or any special comments that the customer has put in their original PO. And when I shipped this, or uh, when I intend to ship this, it was in Orking 2 that I dragged in the shipping instructions for these uh, desk lamps, and which we saw was available then back on the purchase order in Ork Limited, and also back on the original sales order. So when uh, you invoice a uh, customer 1200 from Ork Limited, you can see what documentation was sent to the customer from or Orking 2 without having to be CC'd on the original email or that documentation to be manually distributed between the different staff in both companies. So just going back to uh, my PowerPoint and uh, looking at the previous slide. So what I've shown you is process scheduler automating regular repetitive tasks in um, say 300 day ends, posting batches, integrity checks and shown uh, that any number of regular tasks can be automated using process scheduler. We've also seen uh, reports being distributed by process scheduler, uh, reports that are saved in Report Runner and Info Explorer Cubes and how to do that. With process scheduler and extender, we've seen alerts being sent to um, sales reps when their customers become overdue or in certain invoices become overdue. And we saw an example of logistics management uh, process automation showing a list of items which are below the minimum stock levels in, a, in a particular locations in a company. We also saw how to configure to automate the integration between systems and to automate uh, processes within a Sage 300 uh, company to eliminate manual entry, re-entry or manual triggering of certain events or processes. And using extender and notes, we've looked at uh, auto-creating PDFs for your invoices and sending those, emailing them off to your customers, and also discussed uh, sending um, consignment note numbers and uh, information to customers on creation of an OE shipment. And finally, we've seen uh, two examples in document management link, how to manage and distribute um, uh, documents between um, your between your staff and team members to avoid uh, you know time wasted in looking for documentation and or errors in um, in acting on that documentation. So some of our other modules, which I'm not going to show you, but just talk to, but we do have uh, videos already up on our website on these modules. So EFT processing can up uh, help you automate processes. 
Um, so EFT processing is the electronic production of the file that the bank needs to to enact a direct debit or a, a payment to a vendor. So if you're not using EFT, if you want, if your banks are going to be doing the payments or the direct debits, you first have to enter your payment batch, and then you have to go into the banking software and rekey uh, the vendor's details, uh, bank account details, and the amount that you want to pay them. But using EFT processing, that file can be electronically uploaded to the bank, uh, avoiding a duplicate rekeying of your payments. Similarly, EFT processing can uh, email your vendors uh, and give, advise them of the payments made without manually running reports and attaching it to an email and sending it off to your vendors when you do do those payments. EFT processing can also be used to create uh, automatically create a receipt batch. So this is good for those types of invoices which are regular and recurring, for example, subscriptions or um, you know, rental uh, payments or memberships which have regular monthly payments. So based on any number of selection criteria to select your invoices, so perhaps you'd use a terms code to create invoices with a particular terms code, those ones which you can direct debit against your customers or automatically create receipts for those ones. Um, and then you can run the create receipt batch function to, to select invoices um, and automatically create the receipt applied to those invoices. Uh, if you're doing create receipt batch, you often do that based on invoice due date and uh, there's no way of controlling or updating the invoice due date after a document is processed and it might have been uh, posted with the incorrect invoice due date. So you can use uh, EFT processing also to update due dates. Inter-entity transactions uh, allows you to automate loan account entries across entities. So without uh, inter-entity transactions, if you are doing payments or receipts um, on behalf of other companies, in company one, for example, you're paying the um, phone account and half of that phone account belongs to company two, without using inter-entity transactions at the end of every period, at the end of every week or month, you need to look through all your expense accounts, work out what portion belongs to uh, your second or third companies, and then do loan, uh, GL for your loan account entries in company one, um, and uh, then log into company two and do a loan account entry, you know, debit expense, credit loan account, back to company one who paid those bills for you. So it's a huge, uh, long reconciliation task, very manual in identifying those transactions and then creating the journals uh, at the same time. But if you use inter-entity transactions at the time the a source transaction is posted, the loan account entries both in the source company and the target companies are created straight away, hence saving um, hours if not days at month end on manually working out what your loan account entries should be. Similarly, inter-entity transactions can mirror bank transfers between entities, so no longer do you have to do the bank entry in company one and, uh, the, you know, to pay company two and then the deposit in company two. You can just do it in one step by recording the bank transfer in company one and it will automatically do the deposit in company two for you. And uh, we saw a little bit of inter-entity trade, um, the ability to create mirrored transactions, either accounts payable to accounts receivable or vice versa, where you're buying and selling goods uh, services between uh, linked companies, or OE to PO, where you're buying and selling goods uh, between entities. So inter-entity trade can automate the the creation of the mirrored document, saving the manual rekeying and uh, the possibility of errors in rekeying those documents. And finally, return material authorizations by providing a central place to key the, uh, the customer, the items that are being returned, um, the reasons for the return, any information that you need to keep track on the returns. And from a central place, you can create replacement orders for those items that you need to replace, credit notes for those items that you need to either write off or return to stock and indeed vendor returns for those items that you want to send back to your supplier. So a return material authorizations allows you to key the information once and then from one cent central place create the associated documents without rekeying. 
Similarly, in RMA, you can click a button to email the authorization to the customer. So um, if your process is the customer needs to attach your authorization to the goods before they send it back, you can do that with a single click without manually having to create the PDF and then attach it to an email and send it off to the customer. So we've seen how um, by automating and uh, mundane tasks and eliminating unwanted errors, uh, you can improve productivity of your staff. You can improve your service delivery to your customers and you can increase the transparency of your um, tasks, all which leads to um, or can lead to increased innovation amongst your staff, increased customer satisfaction and increased compliance in your organization. I've got run through all that I've intended to run through at this stage, so uh, if you've got any questions, if you wouldn't mind popping them in the question box. And while you're doing that, I'd just like to call your attention to go to our website, orchid.systems, where we have a, a number of videos uh, loaded up there, and indeed this video will be loaded up uh, just as soon as we've had time to, to produce it. Um, and you can find videos and uh, literature on all our modules uh, individually and uh, combined as in this particular presentation. So are there any questions for me? Just looking at the question box, I don't see anything at this stage. Nope, everything I said must have been as clear as mud. Well, thank you very much for attending this session and we will be distributing this, uh, this um, webinar uh, to you in the next couple of days and it'll also be up on our YouTube channel for you to review later. Thank you very much for attending. Bye.